All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. If people keep trickling in, I'll, I'll let them in from the waiting room. This is a new feature from my university. We now have to <laughs> authenticate everybody. Um, so welcome to the fourth in the ethnographic workshop series that is organized by Fulbridge and Fulbrighter in collaboration with Educarte, which is a nonprofit organization that I have founded. Um, this is, like I said, the fourth in this series. So the first workshop that we did was a panel discussion about um, cultural encounters in Fulbright research. The second was about participant observation. The third was about interviewing. And now this fourth one is about sharing your research findings. And I use this kind of broad term because I know that there are people that share their research findings in different ways, not just with academic publications. So I wanted to leave this as open as possible to let us have a conversation about what happens after the Fulbright grant. And I came up with this idea about a year ago. Um, I saw a call on the Fulbrighter Network from Zoe Gyoja, or Gyoja, I'm not sure how to pronounce her name, um, on the Fulbrighter Network asking for people to lead research workshops about any topic that they were interested in. And I have been really interested in uh, how, how these cultural encounters affect our Fulbright research. Um, the, the Fulbright miss mission is to, part of the mission is to become a cultural ambassador. And my research is dance anthropology or dance ethnography. So my research is very, very tied to culture, but I'm also interested in the ways that um, people who are working in, uh, in other disciplines um, in, experience the culture and how that cultural experience informs their research in various ways. And sometimes it might not be so direct, but I'm still interested to hear about how, you know, people in the sciences, for example, people in the medical field use these cultural experiences to, um, to inform their research. Um, I want to give a little background on the Fulbridge and Fulbrighter uh, relationship. Usually Zoe would be here to give this presentation. She's asked me to do it in her place. So I'm going to share my screen really quickly. All right. So Fullbridge was founded in 2015 by Zoe and she founded it when she was on her grant in South Korea, she wanted to create an online workspace for grantees by grantees um, that really focused on active engagement and community building. So she really wanted to create a lot of activities that would get people engaged, get people talking to each other. I think that she found that she felt maybe like she wasn't connected to other Fulbrighters. And so she created this space online in order to um, to connect people. And if you go to the website fullbridge.org, you'll see there's a map, which is pretty cool. You can look at different parts of the world and click on different, um, there are like little, little dots that you can click on and see who people are, what they're doing, where they're coming from, what their research is about, and that sort of thing. And there's a way to, to email them or ping them and, and get in touch. Um, so Fulbrighter is um, a networking site that was founded in that was launched in 2015 and it's more of a network gathering place um, where again people come together but the difference between the two and Fulbrighter decided to work with Fulbridge in this way and to collaborate is that Fulbrighter is kind of like the community building kind of like the space whereas now Fulbridge is creating the activities to actually occur in that building so putting on different workshops putting on different um, I'm not sure what other kinds of engagement activities there are, but, um, but creating those activities for people to get together. And so if you are interested um, in learning more about Fulbridge or Fulbrighter, um, there is a Fulbridge research space, which I link to a research space for this workshop series in my email, and I'll send it again in the email after this workshop. Um, and that's where we can continue these discussions. Uh, if there's anything that came up that you didn't get a chance to say or anything that you want to add. Also, you can find out about upcoming workshops. If you're interested in leading your own workshop, you can, uh, you can contact Zoe at, Fulbr at contact at fullbridge.org um, and let her know what ideas you have. She's been, for me, wonderful to work with and really open to any kind of idea. And there are also some open volunteer positions if you're interested.
All right, so we have a very small group today, which is great. Um, I've been changing around the times of the workshops in order to allow people in different time zones to participate. And so this one was a little bit lighter on the registration, uh, but thank you all for coming. Um, I would love actually, since we have this small group to go around if you're comfortable sharing who you are, what, where your Fulbright grant was, um, or if you haven't done a Fulbright grant yet and you're interested, what you're interested in, and a little bit about your research. Um, so I can start. Again, I'm Kate. Uh, I was in Recife, Brazil in 2018 to study Frevo, which is a carnival dance from the state of Pernambuco. And so my work is about dance anthropology. I use ethnographic methods in my work. I'm really interested in dances of resistance and the ways that embodied knowledge is transmitted. So I'm wondering if we could go around. I see three other people with their cameras on. Um, maybe Wu Bolson, I'm not sure how to say your name, but if you could introduce yourself if you're comfortable. Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Abwasan. I'm from Kazakhstan, I'm a Jew. I've been there. Uh, you can see the beautiful city <laughs> near the mountains. Um, so I'm here. Um, now I'm uh, at the University of Georgia. Of Georgia. So uh, I'm a Fulbright associate this year. This year. So I'm um, teaching Russian uh, for the first semester and will be teaching Kazakh for the next semester. Next semester. Semester. So, um, should I say about my research or a plan? A future plan? So, my future plan is um, so now I'm um, observing uh, how training well, um, like how college work has a people abroad um, choose a certain code uh, and how do they switch from one language to another and when they insert foreign language in their speech. Um, maybe I'll look at identity part and also, yeah, I'm just, uh, now I'm like scanning, I have a big scan and uh, I'm recording them already. I have two Kazakh people here. So we have a, a state uh, program, which is a state scholarship, uh, which is uh, which covers all the universities here. So it's a program called Bolashak. So I have two Bolashak um, scholars here. And uh, yeah, I'm recording them for now. I have uh, maybe five hours material now for now. And yeah, I'm doing uh, like trans transcription. Uh, I'm transcribing their speech and then we'll analyze how do they choose Great, thank you. Um, let's go to Benjamin. Hi, everyone. Is the uh, sound working okay? Good. Good, great. Well, uh, good morning. It's nice to meet you all. I actually don't think I know any of you. Um, my name is Ben Young. I'm a cultural anthropologist. Um, I'm broadcasting to you from uh, the town of New Paltz, New York, in the Hudson Valley, where I teach at the State University of New York um, here, here in New Paltz. Um, I have done, uh, yeah, I've done a couple of Fulbrights in Brazil. Actually, I most recently, right after Kate in Recife, Brazil, I uh, was there in the fall of 2018. Um, and my interests are, I, I'm, an, I'm an ethnographer by training, so, that's, um, so this is great for me. I'm, I'm embarrassed that I somehow missed all of this happening earlier in the year, and I just, I don't, I clearly, there, this was really awesome and important, and I'm sorry that I didn't, I didn't know about it, so. Um, but I'm very interested in all of these things. Uh, my own work is on, um, uh, political sentiment and um, cultural memory among um, working class and poor people in Brazil. So I do all of my research is kind of on on that that theme. So excited to be here. Also, apologies in advance. Uh, at uh, in 35 minutes from now, I have to disappear to, to teach a class. So I'm just apologies in advance. No, no worries. 
And yeah, I mean, all of the, the recordings from the last workshops are online. There's a link to it in the agenda. So if you want to go back and look at them, all of that is there. Also, we're probably going to do another series, maybe starting in a few months, and it may be just a repeat of the same topics, or I might evolve it a little bit more. I haven't decided yet, but we'll definitely keep this up. Um, let's go to Rick. And you're muted, Rick. You're muted. Yeah. I'm Rick Bine. I'm a professor of geography at IUPUI in Indianapolis. That stands for Indiana University, Purdue University of Indianapolis. And uh, essentially combined the two universities, uh, Purdue and then at IU, <laughs> little towns north and south. Anyway, uh, my area of interest is in terms of traditional agriculture. And uh, I've been doing that for a long time. Uh, initially, worked, I think I initially worked in Brazil, in Mato Grosso, and uh, did uh, work there in uh, what's now Southern Mato Grosso. At the time it was one state only, and I did work on the, um, the colony, uh, colonialization, you're bringing in colonies, uh, people, uh, Nordestino, people from uh, uh, probably Recife <laughs> and uh, uh, other parts, Sierra, Sierra and other parts of, uh, of uh, the uh, Northeast. They were uh, taking up land and then uh, essentially they were given like 30 acres, this sort of thing, studying that. Anyway, I uh, also did a Fulbright in uh, Mozambique. And I was able to use my Portuguese there and taught at the University of uh, Eduardo Manlani. And, my research there was dealing with the, I call it four-story agriculture, and looking at the different levels of plants uh, cultivated together, not just four, but level, levels of four, but probably 50 different plants together, and how that works ecologically speaking. And, uh, so uh, that was, uh, Great. that was one. Also, okay. Great, thanks. We have at least three Brazilianites so far. Marjorie. Yes, hello. Um, I'm a retired nursing professor from Bethel University, which is located in Minnesota. I had a Fulbright to um, University of Oslo, Norway in 2005, and then um, a couple of Fulbright specialist awards back to Norway in 2010, and then New Zealand in 2012. So my project when I was at University of Oslo was uh, qualitative interviewing um, about end of life decision making. So, and that was successful. I had a published academic book, you know, coming from that. Um, now that I'm retired, I'm on to kind of a new area and um, have finished a qualitative research project on interviewing family members who have a relative living with bipolar disorder. And so um, I'm finding the publishing world in the non academic field much more challenging because I really want to. I've done a book that would be for the general public on, on those stories, but so I'm very interested in that discussion. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, Faye. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, all right. Hi, uh, my name is Faye Ricker. I am a, a PhD candidate at the University of South Florida. Um, I just I uh, was in Kenya on my Fulbright this um, 2019 to 2020, got cut a couple months short by COVID. Um, but I uh, am in the field of the geosciences broadly. Uh, my research is with uh, four indigenous communities that were relocated uh, for geothermal energy development in Kenya. Uh, and I've been doing ethnographic work to, you know, um, examine issues of uh, gender and energy use, as well as sort of place-based uh, understandings of, of energy and, and geothermal specifically. Um, so that's where I'm at now. Great, thanks. Aditi. Hi, uh, I'm Aditi and I have joined in from uh, India. 
so I am a, a doctoral candidate at the Indian Institute of Technology, uh, Bombay in India. And I was on a Fulbright uh, at uh, the University of Pennsylvania from 2018 to 19 uh, as a doctoral fellow. Uh, and uh, my research is uh, based on microfinance and self-help groups of women in uh, rural India, particularly the southern part. And uh, during uh, my Fulbright, I uh, wanted to understand the, the, the pedagogy and the interdisciplinary perspective between uh, policy making and uh, the gender equations, uh, like you know, the, how uh, participating in a financial program in the public domain impacts the gender equations in the household. So, Great, thank you. And I did uh, reschedule this this workshop to be earlier in the day so that people who are in India can, because I got so many requests that people in India wanted to participate. We always had them too late. So thank you for joining. Peter. Good morning. I'm Peter Yashafnik. Uh, I trained originally as an anthropologist, although my Fulbrights were not in anthropology. Uh, my, field, my original field work was in uh, Ethiopia. And uh, I went back as a Fulbright to Ethiopia to do hydrology. And uh, my second Fulbright was in Namibia. And I did uh, uh, basically try to help the university bring uh, distance education to the rural sites. And uh, I'm still interested in anthropology, even though I haven't practiced it for many, many, many years. That's it. Thank you. Uh, Kimmel. Hi, greetings from Jakarta. Good morning, good uh, evening, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you for having me and glad to join the groups. My, I'm based in Jakarta and I do some uh, teaching at a local university here, but I also work with the government and the NGO is a kind of a mix of my activities. Uh, my Fulbright year was in 2000, uh, 2017 at Northeastern University in Boston. My area was uh, in urban resilience and public policy. So I'm not really uh, trained as an anthropology or using this uh, uh, technique and methodology, but I'm interested to write something about uh, urban resilience and I'm trying to do on the, if I can use the word and the ethnography of organization of ethnography of bureaucracy, because this is how the urban resilience policy will be developed. And I'm interested to write something about how the bureaucracy works and why it works and why it doesn't. So I don't know, maybe that, that's a methodology will help me to get a better picture rather than my, my background of uh, uh, trained as uh, urban planning and organizational studies, so a uh, kind of a bit more uh, formal, structural, institutional kind of uh, planning, and then a more uh, what the engineering systemic approach. But perhaps now I'm trying to do in a different way, by like ethnographing the, the the person, the agent that works in the system. So I'm I'm keen to learn from all of you here, and thank you for for having this session, Kate. Uh, very, 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 very helpful, useful for me personally. Thank you. Great, thank you. You're very welcome. Um, Heather, who I think gets the most stars for coming to the most workshops <laughs> in the series. <laughs> thank um, you. Okay. <laughs> if my, my, my dog might bark, so I apologize. <laughs> We have been playing musical rooms throughout the COVID time. So um, my son's in school and my partner is upstairs on the computer. It's crazy. So I'm here because, yeah, I really um, appreciate I'm not only hearing from everybody because I just returned from my Fulbright exchange in France in um, February and then COVID hit. So I think that this has been um, a really important place for me to um, to be in the community, which I really need. I'm a theater maker and director and um, educator at, at a community college. I teach drama and we are really um, in a bind. Um, theaters have closed and it's been very hard for me to concentrate and kind of think about where I'm going in my path and my career. And 
My background actually is in anthropology. My undergraduate was in anthropology, and then um, my PhD was in um, performance as public practice, which is sort of a nerdy way of saying, I like everything that is performative and writing about it and studying it. When I was in France, I was doing um, devised theater making with migrant uh, communities with an NGO and another uh, volunteer organization in Aix-en-Provence and in Marseille. And I, um, really miss it and I really miss uh, being involved in embodied space, doing work within community and um, developing research based around, um, and I'm getting more and more kind of obsessed with this term, but creating um, theatrical moments of joy in community at a time of crisis and trauma and tension. So I've been, um, it's, been sort of the latest thing um, for me. So thank you for hosting all of these. It's been, it's really nice to be, to hear from everybody. It feels really, really good. So thank you. Yeah, it's like the one thing we have. The first one of these was like end of March. So it was like right after COVID hit and I didn't know how to use Zoom, which is hilarious to me now because <laughs> who doesn't know how to use Zoom now? I mean, it feels very, very normal. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's been a nice way to connect. Um, I see one more person who doesn't have a name on, but has a nice turquoise blouse or teal blouse. If you haven't introduced yourself yet. Uh, Kay, this is Chad Buderbach. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Chad. Hi. I, I don't know if I was anonymous or just what, but um, uh, my name is Chad Buderbach. I am based in Baltimore, Maryland, and I am here primarily to support Kate and the growth of Educarte. Uh, I work at the Maryland State Arts Council, where my job is Maryland State Folklorist, making me responsible for traditional arts grant making in the state of Maryland. I have been in this job for about five years, following another five years of training and experience in ethnographic methods as a folklorist. And I have not thought about ethnography in any depth in that time. And I have actually found that the farther I drift from those methods, the more effective I am at my job. So I'm very curious to hear about folks who are practicing the methods now and uh, how they are implementing those and how folks are making inroads to bring ethnographic methods into the public sector or into administrative work like the sort that I do. I've never received a Fulbright, uh, but I am an interested observer. So thanks, Kate, for holding the space. Great, thank you, Chad, for coming. Um, I think Maria, is that, is that you without the name on the, on the screen? My name is there. Oh, now I see it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, how are you? Um, yes, my name is Maria Lino. I'm a multidisciplinary visual artist. And after I met Kate through Zoom, I realized that I am extremely interested in ethnography, that a lot of the work I do is, is some form of ethnographic. Anyway, my Fulbright uh, was in Peru. And I created an, it's an ongoing series a series of art documentary video on women that work with their hands. And now what I mean is not necessarily craft, although that is also included, but cooks, uh, domestic workers, uh, children. And I've been going, my February was in 2011. I've been going every year except this year because of COVID. And I go to different towns because they invite me. So I go to the uh, towns of origin from Lima, the capital and and film them and then i edited it in dip tricks and tip, uh, trip tricks not using music but using the sound of whatever work they're doing uh, to create this uh, really rhythmic repetition of what daily work is so i've been from the amazon to 5,000 meters above sea level, both, you know, filming uh, these women. So some of you, I notice, also uh, have been working with uh, labor, 
basically, I'm very interested in, in women's labor and also in global migration. So that's a general. Thank and you. I have to leave early. I'm taking a class history of, of a printmaking at 11, so I'm very sorry. Yeah, no worries at all. You can come and go as you please. Um, and I see that Liliana is driving, so we'll, we'll let her focus on driving. Please be careful. Um, all right, so let's let's dive in now that we know a little bit more about each other. Um, we've already talked about kind of specific ethnographic methods in terms of observation and participant observation and the interviewing and a lot of this has come up in terms of ethics and I think that cultural appropriation and those kinds of issues have been other topics that have come up in previous discussions. Um, and so I collected all of your questions from the registration form and I saw kind of four main categories. One is kind of publishing, but pro broadly defined. So not just publishing a work, but maybe creating a work of art like Maria or creating a theater work like Heather. Um, for me, kind of creating a dance or something. Um, also collaboration and partnership. So how do we build these long-term collaborations with people in our, our host countries or at our host institutions? Um, since that seems to be one of the, the main goals of, of Fulbright is not to just kind of go and, you know, have a obviously not just have a vacation, but actually collaborate with people and build some kind of partnership. And also, activism has come up a lot. I think that in our in our last workshop, actually, there was a lot of discussion in terms of doing oral histories and um, and talking to uh, talking to people who were activists, but also that the researcher themselves were activists as well. And what are the ethics of that? And so then in terms of sharing those findings, how do we how do we share that in an ethical way? Um, and then finally, there were some country specific topics um, working in India. So I think we only have one person here who works works in India now, but there were a lot of questions about that in, in the registration. So if we if we get to that, we'll get to it. But I'm interested to hear from you, first of all, just broadly speaking, what are some of the ways that, that you share your findings, um, whether it's kind of traditional scholarship or um, other more creative ways? For me, I think that I've been surprised how much the Fulbright experience kind of launched me into, um, into, I wouldn't say activist work, but really advocating for studying um, dances, studying dance and, and music from an ethnographic perspective and um, trying to help students both at the university, but also um, like in my community, trying to build engagement opportunities to learn about culture through embodied participation. Um, and so it's been really interesting for me um, with Educarte, which is the organization that I founded to kind of think about beyond the university, what are the ways that we can also share this information more publicly to a general, to a general audience or a, an audience that is really specifically interested in like for me, Brazilian dance, or my background's in Irish dance, so also in Irish dance, which is a very specific niche community. But I'm interested to hear from all of you um, what other ideas you have. Yeah, go ahead, Benjamin. Okay, um, well, I'll just throw something into this. I, I, I mean, I, you know, I'm a, an academic in a conventional academic kind of set, setting. So the expectations for my job are that I publish and give research presentations and that sort of thing. But I understand this is, you know, where this is an occasion to think beyond that. Um, and I, I'll just say one thing I, I struggle with, um, you know, I, I do extended field work where I, you know, live in the communities that I research and ask a lot of time from the people I'm studying and in the process be become friends with many of them. Um, and uh, so there's this eth big ethical question of what did they get out of it and what, what and, and this isn't an e easy question. I'm not trying to, uh, you know, I, I love Fulbright, but, but, for, but actually Fulbright does, it's not a part of doing a Fulbright to give, to present what you learned back to the community where you 
did the work. And, um, and that's an ongoing struggle for me. And again, it's not a critique. It's just my life isn't strong. I mean, I go back to Brazil as often as I can, which before COVID was at least once a year. Um, but, um, you know, so I, I'm interested actually just in if other people have reflections on, I mean, of course, we're all on, on online social media and I'm in WhatsApp groups with the people that were important in my ethnography and we're always sharing stuff. But, but, um, but you know, it's, it's a challenge, it's a, it's a unique challenge to find out, to think for me to think about, you know, it's not enough to send a research paper published in English or even a research public paper published in Portuguese to the community where I work. I have to go there and actually organize something and present it for them. And that's not an easy thing to do, but I feel ethically it's very, very important. Um, so I just wanted to throw that into the, the mix. Yeah, I agree completely. Also working in Brazil, I, I worked on two articles really, really hard and I was <laughs> pretty proud of them. And then I sent them over and, you know, nobody wrote back because I don't, you know, I don't even know if they read them. And I, you know, I don't know what they think. So um, I think that one thing that I've been trying to do is create opportunities to either bring them here to the US, which is not happening right now because of COVID, but I'm looking for funding. That's part of what my organization is about, um, is trying to get these artists who don't, who maybe some of them would be invited to the United States to do a workshop, but not necessarily. Um, I met some amazing dancers and, and teachers when I was there, and I really want to bring them here and have them share some of their work. I've also um, found that actually during COVID, I've been able to take classes and send, you know, <laughs> pay for my classes that I'm taking through Zoom in Brazil, you know, and it's, it's kind of been a nice way to give back and say, hey, I'm still part of this community. I'm still learning from you all, you know, and it's, I'm not just, I, I'm trying to give back in that way. So I think COVID has both been negative and positive in that way. If I can, if I can, hi, yes. Um, yes, besides all these Zooms that I keep track, I think this is very important. Um, because I work with women that many were child domestic workers and the NGO that I did and still do when I go to Peru, volunteer work, they're trying to eradicate child domestic work, uh, which is now is getting again to be a very extremely serious problem. It was already a serious problem, but now with COVID even, even uh, more. So I did these videos and I still like, Altogether, I have like 16 videos of 16 different women, and I'm still editing <laughs> since I go every year. And what I wanted to do is to have a one-person show in a really nice cultural institution in Lima or in whatever other city, and the women to be the guest of honors. Because if you go to any exhibition in, in Lima in general, you will see people that look like us, <laughs> you know? And very rarely you would see anybody that you would think is either of Andean descent or Amazonian descent or more what they call the original people, you know, Pueblo Originarios. And so that was my thing. I really wanted them to be the guest of honor. And I've been so close twice to have this in, in a couple of institutions because the, I found a curator that really loves the idea. And a few months before he gets kicked out, uh, they changed the, the what, whatever, they, they changed the, the area, they gave it to somebody else. So it's something that I'm still trying to do. So here in the US, I've had those exhibitions in New York, I've had a here. I did have one of my videos in a, that was in a group show, group show in Germany and in Poland, in Warsaw and Berlin, um, also in Cyprus. But really, I still want to have this in Peru. I really want those women. And yes, at the beginning, it was this thing. They looked at me because they told me, you know, you have, you have money and you're white and and i'm like i come from working class family i really had to earn their uh, their trust and i do not do as i presented in another in another one of your zoom uh, workshops i don't do formal interviews 
the women can tell me whatever they want of their life. Uh, and if you, culturally, there's a big difference in general between the Amazon and the Andes. And usually the Andean women or the Andeans in general are much more reserved. It takes a long time for them to trust to when, once they do, they'll, they'll open their life to you, you know, and I've stayed in their homes and I mean, uh, but the Amazonians usually the first day to tell you your life story. So I have those kinds of, of videos that some, of course, they'll tell me whatever. And then, and then others that are much more reserved. I did have a lady in the north of Peru, close to Ecuador, that she told me, you can film me cooking, but I will not say a word. You make me nervous and your camera makes me nervous. And I said, but are you sure? So money-wise, I haven't made any money except the four months that I was in the Fulbright. And of course, I also taught. Um, uh, so when I can, I help anybody, but it's, I really haven't had any money for, for that. Anyway, yes, in general, there, there's just a lot of things. Yeah, I think that's fascinating. I mean, we touched on this a little bit in the interviewing workshop because yes. um, there's there's this idea that, you know, we have to be careful about how we quote people and, you know, how we use their words. But for those of us that work with movement in various ways, how do we use that information, you know, and what are the ethical ways to share the way that somebody moved or what you understood through their movement, which is based so much on our own assumptions. And, you know, we have to, we, ha I have to do interviews because I have to ask, you know, is my assumption about what you're doing in dance correct? Or am I misinterpreting it because I come from a different cultural background? Um, so I think that's fascinating, you know, and it, it brings in, it, it highlights how we have to be careful about how we share, you know. Okay. Just one story that you, you reminded me uh, this lady that, and I'm filming her making Juane, which they usually do uh, during St. Uh, John the Baptist celebration, and, and, and it's very typical in the Amazon. So she's making, I've been following her for two days with the camera, literally hour after hour. So by the third day, she tells me this very, very, very personal story. So I, I, I was with the camera, and I'm like, I'm not sure if I should film this, but anyway, so I edited it and showed it to her. And she was, no, you don't put this, this is for you, this was not. And I said, no, 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 that's it, it's out. It's, it's not in your, in your video. I made two, uh, I, actually, I still have another video for to, to, to film. Uh, for, but she got really upset and I was, you know what? I asked you, but if you don't want it, it's out of there. Don't worry. So this, there's always this balance. Even though she saw my camera and I had been filming her for, you know, this was already the third day. So, yeah, you don't. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Academic-wise, I have been working. In fact, yesterday there was a Zoom meeting with video dance, as a matter of fact. But that's a different story. That's, that's more academic. I actually gave a lecture last year when I was in Peru at the university in a choreography class about video dance, obviously not about dance. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I'll share a little bit. Uh, one of the things talking about like what Benjamin was saying, get, in, get into community and just stay there. I've lived 12 years in the tropics, uh, you know, and three of those were on uh, Fulbright's. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, you, you get to know people. I mean, studying the agriculture, you actually move into their village and find out what they're doing and, and sometimes participate right there with them and it, as you learn how they do their techniques. But, uh, and it's also kind of, it's like they're, they, they're, they, their idea of having friends is very different from ours, I think, in a sense, in this country, in the US, we are friends, we're less connected sometimes to friends, but there you become bonded with them so much. And it's, it is kind of heartbreaking that when you don't, you're gone suddenly, where, where's, where do you go? You know, when are you gonna come back? You know, this kind of thing. And so it's, uh, that is a sad thing, but I am sharing my work. Uh, uh, I've been always been associated with universities where I've gone. And, uh, that, that's not totally correct. I, I was in the Peace Corps originally in Brazil and uh, not was from the university, but uh, I was one for my dissertation work. But anyway, 
I, when I publish things, I publish a number of articles, in these different Egypt, academic things. So I always send them back to those universities where I was, so that at least it gets shared in that way. And uh, there, uh, it's sometimes, uh, sometimes I find people that have already been in those areas, uh, I, uh, and then make make new bondings, you know, different connections and this sort of thing, and keep things up. Today, with all the internet that's out there, you know, so when I first went in, it, it, uh, there was no internet. There was, you know, the communications was very, very slow. And, and so uh, now the, the internet and like uh, I, somebody said a minute ago, how <laughs> the Zoom has totally taken over our lives. <laughs> and before March, I never, I've heard of Zoom, but I've never been on one. And now I've been on maybe 30 or 40 <laughs> every month. And uh, it's amazing. And I think that's another way to make connections as, uh, as we do that, and working with different countries and things like that. Uh, one thing, I am retired. And one of the things I'm doing is writing, and this is sort of like Marjorie's doing, writing up stories of my experiences there, not academic, but just it's a, lot of, a lot of interesting things happen. You know, I'm talking about many, some humorous, some very sad, and you just write those up. And I'm creating a book of all these little stories uh, that will, uh, I don't know, I need to find some place to publish it. But at this point, I've got about 60 of them written up and uh, I'm uh, excited about it. But I talked to a publisher and they went, huge amounts of money. <laughs> and then the, you only get 5% of the royalties. <laughs> so I'm so, uh, uh, looking at that but i'm still writing so i'm i haven't been real uh i haven't pursued it too much anyway i'm just just telling you about that so yeah that, that's one thing that i find fascinating like the stories from from the experience on the ground when i go back after after you know months i've been working on an article and the article is finally done and it's been edited you know 15 times and it's down to the you know exactly what needs to be told in the article to make it a nice concise and clear article but when i go back to my original field journal and i look back and read and i remember like the tiny details about walking to the grocery store the supermarket or just walking down the street and i saw you know something and i just you know and i was affected by it or i was in a bad mood that day it's just you know um because not every experience is positive you know sometimes it's really a struggle so it's just fun to go back and think about wow there's actually so much more than what actually gets shared and so i have been interested in the ways that you know maybe we could tell these stories in other ways i don't know if the the ethics of publication um are, are the same with that if i wanted to you know, write up stories like you, Rick, and, and Marjorie are doing, but um, but I think there's so much of the richness of the ethnographic experience, the cultural experience, is in those day to day. And then by the time it gets to what an academic publisher will publish, it's like I hope it's not dry, but you know, it's it's not it's not the same. And that's one reason why I get a little bit embarrassed sending an article to the dancers that I worked with because I'm like, oh. I know like there's so much more and we we felt it when we were in the space together moving together and laughing and you know and I can't even write it down you know some things just can't be can't be written but I'm really interested in in that process that's the way you get it out <laughs> I just wrote quickly I wrote a story on driving in Brazil it's not very long but there's a lot of chuckles in there <laughs> that is not something that I had the courage to try <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think that um, when, again, I'm still processing everything because um, I recently returned and I have so many notes. And I think um, to what you're saying, Kate, for me, the, the experience is almost built on the little tiny moments that are precious as opposed to um, my grand theories about what we were doing in this space. And I think that I'm, the biggest struggle for me is trying to, uh, is trying to please the academic community, but also please the artist self in me that thinks that like this really tiny moment in the middle of nowhere south of France with, you know, five people in a room 
to me, it was of monumental significance what we were doing. But then I'm having a hard time trying to make this seem like it is information and data that other people want to read and explore. It just sounds, it, it, it seems so myopic. It seems, it, it seems like a sequestered little experience, almost as if it is more of a, of a, of a story, a short story or um, a, like a memoir even, but I don't, I don't want to go in that direction. And, and I, um, I've been having a lot of struggle with how to present this research that does justice for the participants as well as um, for myself and the academic community. There, I don't think they would really want to read an article. Like they, their expectation for me is to, is to have it be just as scintillating and brilliant and bright as the experiences that we were having together in, in the room. And, and um, you know, being in the theater and <clears throat> really understanding that, that drama is an internal process that one has. I apologize. I, he's six months old, my puppy. <laughs> um, he was way more a second ago. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll probably have to be quiet. It's, it's, it's pretty loud. But anyway, so I just wanted to say that, yeah, that's an issue for me is just those little moments are actually the moments that I really um, uh, savor. Yeah, I remember when I wrote my dissertation, my advisor said to me, but you show up so much in this in this dissertation. This was not in Brazil, this was in on the island of Montserrat in the Caribbean. And she said, you know, there were photos that I I showed up in a couple of the photos that I included. I was in the stories and she was like, it's just really she was trained as a like strict anthropologist and and she was like, you know, I I just it's not normal in a dissertation to have yourself show up so much. And I was like, I I tried to take myself out in response to that feedback, but looking back on it, I, I feel justified in including myself because I think that my positionality is so important. And I was um, specifically studying um, influences from Irish dance in the Montserrat and Masquerade dance because it's known as having the, the widest Irish influence out of all the islands on the Caribbean. And I was there as an Irish dancer and I was interested in the ways that dancers and musicians were interacting with me and there were some ways where the masquerade dance was a, a parody of Irish dance back when it was originally developed and I was in a situation where they were doing a parody of me at one point on stage and I didn't realize it till afterwards I was like they you know they were making fun of me and it was all in good faith you know but I had to tell that story because it was so telling about you know, this history, we talk about the narrative of, you know, back in the 18th century, there was this parody of Irish slave masters and on Montserrat. I was, you know, not as oppressive as an Irish slave master. I was not as threatening, obviously, but there was some like reference to that history that I, that I experienced. And I felt that I had to, had to tell that story, but I remember being told, well, you shouldn't, you shouldn't include yourself so much. And it just felt impossible to do that as as a fellow dancer. You know, I my approach is to go into a community and say, first, I'm a dancer. By the way, you know, I'm also studying, I'm doing research, but I'm here to dance with you, you know? Um, and so that has always been really important to me in terms of how I how I frame the ways that I talk about the experience. I I can just share, oh. Mm -hmm. I'll share that I was able to um, bring my research findings back to the community when I got um, a Fulbright specialist um, to, to New Zealand, uh, because that is a consulting teaching experience. And I was able to take research that I'd done on end of life decision making um, to um, Maori community in Northern, it was a healthcare community in Northern on the North Island um, of New Zealand. And it was so well received. So one way to build is, is using a specialist award to do that, to bring it back to the community. And then um, as a result of my um, co collaboration in, in Norway, um, I connected with a couple of public health nursing educators there 
and we were able to, um, I, I think we got inspired working together. They actually came to Minnesota to do some work on their um, doc, doctoral work. And then they ended up spearheading uh, International Public Health Nursing Conference in Norway, which now has been in several other countries. But then I was able to present the research when I went back for a specialist in Norway too. So there's kind of ways to connect that, taking original research back to communities um, actually through Fulbright Awards. So I found that um, extremely rewarding to do. And then just regarding my uh, current research on um, looking at family stories um, about having a, a relative living with bipolar disorder, um, one thing that I'm doing um, methodology-wise is after doing the interview, I've written, written their story using a lot of their words and quotes. But then I do a second interview. I send them the, the story, and then they're able to um, give me feedback, make changes, say, oh, I don't want that in there, or I would really want people to know that. And so that whole process, um, I think, has been, um, I can make sure that it's really, you know, good data. And since I've had trouble publishing my book and the stories, what I'm now doing is doing a website and putting the, the family stories on there. And I'm hoping that the website then will be maybe an avenue to interesting a publisher. So the challenge is, you know, writing for um, a non-academic audience. That's been my biggest challenge. So I just wanted to share that. Yeah, I do get the sense what, what Benjamin said earlier about, um, you know, that that Fulbright is kind of like you go, but there's no uh, motivation to to give back. And that actually wasn't my experience in my proposal writing process. I I was made aware that it was really important to find some way to build a collaboration or to build a partnership so that you are giving back in some way. Um, and also making the research available to the general public. So having something like an online blog or a website or some way that you can share that isn't just, you know, for the ivory tower, you know, writing and academic language, but something that that anybody could understand. So I've I've also really been um, exploring the ways that we can that we can share that that not just writing, you know, experiences, creating experiences that I would like to build based on the, the, the Fulbright experience that I had. Um, Marjorie, oh, sorry. I wanna let Kemal go because he had his, um, he was muted, I mean, unmuted before. Yeah, uh, sorry, I just, I cannot uh, share much about my ethnographic experience because I'm basically pretty much to say doing kind of a uh, reflective uh, inquiry kind of uh, action research. But the way I learned from my colleague that maybe ethnographic reporting is just have some strength. And this is uh, related to Heather posting in the, in the chat box. And you mentioned about how to put yourself in the reporting. I think, I think this, this is an important part in, in, in my, my view because I'm now involved in, a, in, a, in an institution that doing the organizational reform and I'm a part of the, the, the process in the institution. I want to share the experience of the challenges and the, the whole experience of doing communicating with the people and working with the other groups. But this is a, a quite a challenge for me and the ethical issue maybe come up uh, coming with this, uh, this uh, approach as well. How then I I put myself or not put myself into the whole stories because the whole interaction is coming with me as a, I as a first person that dealing with the, the other people and second person and third person as well. Uh, the whole communication, discussions, uh, my reflective uh, thinking, I think I, I want to share with you, with, you, with the bigger audience. So if there are people doing the, the same process and organizational changes uh, they can learn from this but i'm i'm still i'm still learning a <laughs> kid so I'm, I'm sorry this i'm i'm, I'm i put more more questions but i learned from you that you also have some challenge on the putting yourself in the in the story but for me uh, personally I, I i think it's a uh, it's a pity if you, you missed that one because 
you are the, the, the important subject in the whole process. Why you should be out from the, from the whole story if, if you are the one that really create that story or part of the story. So I don't know whether this is kind of a uh, discussion, debate. I, I read a little bit on the autoethnography, which is something that I learned. This is something that you put yourself but into the whole story. This is something I'm still working on this, but I'm, I'm really planning to, to write something about, not in a more technical way of the, the, the uh, organizational reporting or those things which I've been doing in my, my, my professions, but I'm trying to do myself into the whole process and share with the bigger audience to learn from the situation. I don't know, just, just want to reflect from your discussion and uh, trigger by Heather notes, but he, he has to argue a lot about the self-reflective uh, process. Why then you still have to argue a lot <laughs> on something which I see is a very important thing and part of the ethnographic uh, approach. If you let other people into the story, why don't you let yourself embed in the, in the whole story as well? I don't know. Maybe you are, you are, you are trained more in the ethnography uh, technique. You, you, you have your, your perspective on this uh, big question for me now try to put myself in the whole process and tell the whole story here. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I myself am still, I'm still learning about autoethnography and exactly what that means because to me it feels a little bit redundant um, because for me ethnography is situating myself and positioning myself in many ways and I think there's the ethics of you know what is objective or what is subjective research and I came from I was a I studied cognitive science for my undergrad, so I was very much in like, you know, the psychology kind of neuroscience kind of writing and that kind of approach to research. I got to grad school and it was, I was in a theater and performance studies program and it was like, you know, suddenly subjectivity was the thing and I was like, this is so wrong, this isn't real rigorous research. And then when I got to the field, I was like, I'm fully embracing my subjectivity now like, because there's no other way to do this ethically. That's how I felt. Um, but maybe somebody that knows more about, you know, the history of the field of anthropology could, could comment on, you know, it seemed like objective research was framed as the more ethical way to do research in the past. Um, but I feel that now, at least in my world, that, that has been changing with, with myself and my colleagues. Um, Rick, you are unmuted. You're, you're muted now. I'd like energetic like ask Marjorie how she how she's publishing her work. So originally I put all the stories, I had them as a whole story, but I found publishers were not interested in whole stories. So then I did it by themes. I did a whole analysis of all the interviews and came up with kind of action themes about how relatives who have, you know, family members that are relatives with bipolar disorder can make their way through the stages of you know realizing what's going on coping and finally you know ending up actually advocating for their relative and for people who are mentally who live with mental health conditions um so i've written the book I, i've actually written two books the first one i decided will not publish then i've written the second one <clears throat> but um i've sent over 50 proposals and queries to agents and so far i'm not getting any interest so that's that's my challenge so I thought by putting the stories on a website, then at least if I get people looking at the website, I can let, I actually had one author say, or one agent say, in order to get an interested publisher, I would need 75 to 100,000 um, followers. <laughs> so, and I'm not a big social media person. So um, that, that's, that's a challenge, so. But I may go the self-publishing route. That may be what I end up doing. Are you seeing the publisher? There's some publishers that they like to they'll publish it, but they want, you know, three thousand dollars. Yeah, and and that I'm not going to do. You have to be very yeah. careful. 
about that. Yeah, so, yeah that that I'm not, I I would rather spend that on self publishing than have a publisher do it. So. Yeah, I yeah. hear you. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh huh. This world of Instagram popularity. I mean, seventy five thousand to a hundred. That's a lot. Um, Chad wrote a really interesting question in the chat. Uh, he says, what do folks in the communities where, where you work say would be the most useful to them as a result of your research? That is, is such a good question. And I realized like, I'm like, did I ever ask them? <laughs> I don't even know if I ever asked them, but I feel kind of embarrassed. But I mean, when I got back, like I continued to do the workshops with them via Zoom. For a little while and then um and then uh august happened and in france like nobody ever does anything in august apparently so we're probably going to start back up again and i feel like what they really want me to do with the research is to is to make them feel that way that they felt again so I, it's almost like i'm uh i'm helping them to access um e some kind of emotional um state of being that is difficult for them to reach on their own. I know that seems very strange to say, and that's what I'm trying to figure out how to articulate, but um, the, the, the joy that we had working together and the escape that I provided for them emotionally and intellectually in these spaces, and also the community building that we were creating where we could be goofy and silly and, and serious all at the same time in that kind of stew that's what they want. They don't want me to show uh, my research. They like pictures. They like me showing pictures of what we've done in the past. And for the NGOs and the um, volunteer organization, they like me sending them like, um, you know, Google slide presentations that are really simple and laid out and that demonstrate to their funders what we were doing when you know these the sensitive population was working with this poor and myself and i think that the, the little contributions that i that i have oh my gosh i can't even concentrate when he's barking i apologize again anyway i think i said enough but that's that's one way is that i just i'm continuing the work via zoom and i am um at, at helping to cultivate um memory of what we had once done and, and finding ways to um, empower them to do these workshops on their own without me um, in community. Because it's not just that we're doing theater techniques. These, these um, folks are learning how to, I mean, we're all learning how to speak French, right? In, in a theatrical setting. So it's language learning and it's also um, public, skill, uh, public speaking skills. It's confidence building, right? So, so it's 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 uh, almost a, like a psychological growth of the participants. That's what is helpful. Okay, I'm muting. I'm sorry. Oh, rough, rough. No worries. Uh, so uh, in my case, my field is in India. And uh, uh, so when I'd come for the Fulbright uh, to the US, it was more for like, you know, as I was saying, the understanding of the pedagogy and the interdisciplinary techniques. However, uh, being in India, my field is also uh, not in the same um, geographical region in terms um, of the way that you know, they speak a different language, a different uh, local language than what I do. So. Um, one of the challenges that I was also facing was that uh, I had to, uh, like, you know, take the help of uh, an interpreter at, at, you know, most of the times. And uh, uh, when I was there in the community, uh, uh, what really helped me was, uh, especially uh, because it was uh, my my host family. Uh, they had like, you know, neighbors who had young kids, so they would come and uh, they wanted to learn English, and I wanted to learn the local language. So in in one way, it helped to really like you know sometimes just watch cartoons with them in the local language, and they would interpret it for me. And uh, I would probably like you know just just speak about what I was doing and uh, about the opportunities that were available to me within India in terms of probably scholarships or other opportunities that helped me pursue what I am doing. And uh, in and even till date, like you know uh, we communicate. Uh, it, 
like you know through whatsapp or some other uh, like they have a smartphone so that helps but uh, otherwise i also am not very sure of how i am really contributing back in terms of the knowledge that i have like you know really gained from my work there but uh, how are how is it really creating any value for them particularly in that space um, i'm not really sure so your uh, like you know feedback like whatever your you, you all shared your reflections were very helpful just want to say that yeah, it's great to get this question, Chad, directly, uh, because I realized that I also never asked it directly. And I know that when I'm thinking through my research di design, I'm thinking, who cares about this? You know, that's always the big question in academic research. Who cares? And I find that that question often leads me into like tying it to some grand theory of culture or whatever, where like when I actually get to the field, who cares is like, we care because we're dancing together, you know, like that's, that's it. Um, but I think that uh, as I've, as I've gotten back and talked to people about my research, I think that increasing visibility of, of cultural forms that don't always get recognition or any kind of value at all. And, you know, in the dance world, the academic dance world, pretty much nothing besides ballet and modern are valued in <laughs> higher ed in, in, um, in dance departments. I mean, I think I can say that pretty broadly. I might be showing a little bit of my frustrations, um, but I think that being able to show like, you know, that this carnival dance uh, called Frevo from Northeastern Brazil, very few people outside of Brazil have heard of it. I think that it, um, I think there's a lot to learn. And I know that I had a lot of personal developments in my own like ability to <laughs> just gain self-confidence and um, move th through the world in a different way by studying Frevo and also Capoeira, which is a Brazilian martial art that Frevo came out of. Um, I really want to share that with people. And I've been taking, as I said earlier, I've been taking class with one of my Frevo teachers on Zoom for the past few months. And I signed up for not just the class where we just dance, but also a class to talk about the pedagogy of teaching this dance style, which I think that I don't even know that most people when they see this dance would think there is a there's a philosophy behind this. There's a pedagogy. And we talk through what are the ways that this dance style breaks down ideas of what beauty is, of what aesthetics are, um, breaking down, you know, the kind of European Western aesthetics that you would see in something like ballet or even Irish dancing, you know, which is where I come from, um, but looking at different ways of, of allowing for individual expression and, and resistance, right, which does have a, a broader social component. And so to me, that's what I think is really interesting. And, and sometimes that just means talking within the community, you know, within the dance community and not, not to a academic community, community necessarily. Although I do feel stronger and stronger with every, every day, more of an advocate for, um, for cultural, culturally specific dance forms in, in the US. I think that they don't get enough respect to be quite honest. And, and I felt that as an Irish dancer my whole life, but also studying other dances and realizing, you know, people are, people have no idea that like carnival dances, like people are just dancing in the streets, drinking, you know, it doesn't look like it's anything that, that requires training or, you know, whatever, but that doesn't matter. There's still so much value in that kind of expression. Kate, thanks for giving that question a little space. I really appreciate it. And, and for describing how you're raising the profile of some of the data you've collected. I saw in the chat, someone referred to uh, creating and publishing a newsletter, sort of aimed at um, sharing the same sorts of stories. Uh, I, I'd also like to suggest that in all of the communities where you're working, um, you, you have a greater depth of expertise than so many other folks. You probably have a decent sense of what sorts of funding would be important to some of your uh, constituents that you're meeting in the field. Uh, and as academics, you're no strangers to grant writing. Uh, so any technical assistance that you could give your communities in that way would probably go a long way. In some cases, their needs might revolve around recognition of their artistic expertise, maybe in other cases, access to clean drinking water. I don't know. But probably there is a need that you could um, leverage some of your expertise to help with 
And for those of you on the tenure track, that, that feels very much like a service item that could go on your CV. Uh, that's just a, a small per perspective from, from the funding world. That's great. Thanks, Chad. I mean, I think that's what it comes down to. When we talk about the value, it, the value is how much money we're willing to put into these communities. And um, I mean, that's part of what my work has been with Educarte, which is relatively new, but just seeing like, I don't have as much space to do this through the academic world. I don't have a tenure track position. I just teach one or two classes at a university per year in, in dance ethnography. Um, but what are the ways that I can, you know, send some money to my amazing teacher in Brazil who changed my life to bring him up here to the United States and hire an interpreter and, you know, give him space to share his, you know, his dance style that many people in Brazil don't even know about. It's from a rural part of Brazil, but, you know, I, I would love to give him that space. And I think that um, being able to support it when, with, with um, helping to write grants, yes, helping, helping folks apply for grants um, and letting them know. I mean, one of this one teacher that I had, I did, I applied for a grant for him for a project that he was doing in his community in Brazil. And I wrote it from here and we didn't get it, but I tried and I was like, I'm, I'm willing to help you with this. I did the same thing for another friend in Senegal who was building um, wells, water access for a community in Senegal because I knew that I knew how to write it you know, and um, I was trying to do what I could to help. I'm looking at the questions on the agenda. I'm, I'm really interested in this. Um, well, there are two questions under activism, actually, that I think are interesting that maybe someone will have something to say about. Um, first, how to share research findings to promote dialogue and action or do activist work? And the second question is, how do you write an ethnography about the, the meta experience of the bureaucracy and the, the policies that you encountered in the country that you were in? I think we've been talking about the writing ethnography about our individual personal experiences, but I mean, there's so much to be said about <laughs> the bureaucratic struggles. At least I had a lot of bureaucratic struggles um, when I was in Brazil and it, it threw me way off my first two weeks being there. I didn't have a place to live and it was just, yeah, it was, it was a struggle. Um, and I would love to write about something like that without coming across as very um, critical but it's certainly a part of the experience. I think that the first month I was, actually the first six weeks when I was in France, I didn't have any access to any of my funds because getting a, a bank account um, in France was like, and you know, there's a joke amongst the French that the French love bureaucracy, you know, more than they probably love being French to a certain extent. So, like, in fact, this was part of my Fulbright, like, proposal was to talk about um, the bureaucracy of that migrants have to go through in the paperwork they have to go through and the performativity involved in um, doing, for example, credible fear interviews and whatnot. Like, there's this, this whole bureaucratic processing of human beings and individuals, which in many ways is antithetical to the whole purpose of, of, of being, like to become a citizen, one has to actually understand the bureaucracy more than being a, um, you know, a, 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 a person of service to the community. Your humorous approach we would do improvisational performances on what it's like to be like go and stand in lines and filling out paperwork and like being at you know the airport and being profiled by tsa agents it well in the united states tsa agents but by you know who the security at the airport the shows to gaulle or wherever you're coming from and and how the the time involved in the bureaucracy is is time away from you know your other pursuits in this world you know learning 
learning a new dance or, or learning the language even, right? And, and, and how the, the, there's a whole different language <laughs> to even filling out the paperwork, right? With acronyms everywhere, you know, all kinds of letterings that for somebody who's new to a country, you have to not only figure out what direction you're trying to go, but what does, you know, an ABL stand for or CDL or whatever it might be, the acronym, you're, you're lost. So there's this, this sense of being completely um, scattered in the bureaucracy and you need somebody to help you through that process. It is, it's like you have to have somebody holding your hand. Otherwise, you will drown in all the paperwork. Yeah, I remember waking up at 4 a.m. so I could go to the the office to get my CEPFE number. Those of you that have been in Brazil, it's like I had to get there at 4 a.m. to stand in line at 5 and then wait in, in line until 9 a.m. to be told that the computer system was down and to come back tomorrow. And then again, you know, it was just all of that. I remember that one of my mentors wrote a chapter in her, her book about, um, about Campesino Theater in Cuba about uh, a whole chapter about waiting in line. And, you know, the kind of like the, the, the embodied experience of, of waiting in line, which I thought was really interesting. Something yeah. real quick. Um, it's kind of a departure from, from the, the bureaucracy kind of activism, but one, um, one thing I ran into uh, when I was in the field, um, you know, I was I was working with communities in that had been displaced for geothermal energy development. You know, just living with them, you know, doing doing my ethnographic work in these communities, and like down the ridge, we could see another community that was actively like being burned um, and chased away by this energy company. And um, so I'm, I, I, I just didn't know my role and my place in, uh, in, in that situation because there was this, you know, I, I'm here talking to this community that had, that had had this happen to them two years ago. And now, you know, we're actively watching it happen to a neighboring community just down, down the mountain. Um, and, you know, it was, it was on the, Front of everyone's mind it was always the first topic of conversation when i would enter someone's house it would be oh like let's look what's happening to the turkanas and it, and it was it was always um it was always the first thing that we would talk about but i also you know there were people in the community that asked me to reach out to you know because they they saw me as as this connection to the west in in a sense um and and i was asked to reach out to news outlets and um, they're like, I just, I didn't know my, my place and my, uh, responsibility in any of that. It was a tough, it was a tough spot for me as, as, as a, a novice at this. This was my, my first foray into the field and, and, uh, you know, I, I, it was, it was kind of a tough spot for me. I don't know if anybody had any insight on that or <laughs> similar experiences. I think it's great to bring that up. I remember that when I wrote my Fulbright proposal, I sent a draft to um, somebody that I was working with on, on building my proposal. He was editing it. And I had written something. This was, you know, I was going into Brazil right when, you know, after the Lava Jato and like, you know, it was like a lot of political turmoil going on. And I had written some things about, you know, that I would maybe look at how politics were affecting dance at this time and, um, and these communities. And I was told to cut anything that had to do with politics because Fulbright is supposed to be about the research and about the culture. And I was told, just, just don't get involved in the politics of it. But then you arrive and like, you can't, you can't ignore it. It's, it's a part of the experience. And Faye, it sounds like your experience was quite, <laughs> was quite intense. Um, and it's hard, you know, how do you then separate that? I, I think you can, but at some level you are asked to, right? And um, what is Fulbright, you know, your funder, the people that are giving you money, what do they want you to, to be commenting on or getting involved with?
I think no one has an answer for that. <laughs> but but really good good questions to ask. Um, I think Vivian was asking, Faye, you were in, in Kenya, right? Uh, I was in, in Nakuru, which is about four to five hours north of Nairobi, um, but my field site was right in between the two cities, um, like at the, the, the big geothermal power plant um, they have developed there. It's interesting. Um, I, I study labor and climate change. So looking at how energy companies in the um, name of climate sustainability, you know, right. sustainability are, are creating uh, some disastrous situations right. is very important. But I'll, I'll, I'll say something um, about Fulbright and, or any government funding when you're involved in a project. I, I mean, I think that you, you really still have to follow your conscience. And, you know, first of all, I think as Americans in another country, the only thing I think that we can do is to help call attention to injustice. And, you know, um, it's not like we're saviors or anything, right? That's, but, um, you know, we do have a, a line to another country, to, to media that we can use. Um, when I was in the UK, uh, one of the first things that happened was a strike. We were a, a campus strike. We were on strike. And, you know, I, I did not consult uh, Fulbright about my relationship to the strike. I was teaching at one class and I joined the picket line and you know what did get involved um i think you know no matter where you are and no matter who's paying your bills i think you have to follow your conscience it doesn't mean that you write that in your fulbright application <laughs> yeah i agree i mean i think that i was able to weave it into my conversation about about dance. I mean, I was talking about the politics of um, of naming something intangible cultural heritage, for example, which I, the people that I talked to in the communities that I was in were quite critical of. Some of them were very, very much embraced it and said, hey, we're getting a lot more funding because of this, but others were saying, this is our killing, this is killing our culture. And I felt that that was important to, to bring up. Um, but, you know, knowing that I go to a conference that is, um, that is organized by, by people from UNESCO every year, <laughs> like, oh, how do I, <laughs> how do I talk about this, you know, but I get, I feel like I get away with it because I'm, I'm talking about it through dance. I'm not just, you know, making these blanket statements. I'm drawing on things that people have told me directly, you know, and trying to give you know, multiple perspectives on the topic too. Like I said, there were people that felt very positive about um, about that designation and other people who were quite critical of it. But um, I think with with many things, there are positives and negatives <laughs> in, in the process of um, politicizing, you know, culture in some ways. So um, I think that my research also has a lot to do with how culture is political and the body is political in a lot of ways. So it's hard to separate that. So we only have a couple of minutes left and I just wanna give some space for any final thoughts. I think this, is, this has been a really nice conversation out of all the workshops. Um, I feel like we've gotten to know each other a little bit better. Um, this has been a really nice, like small conversation, which I really appreciate. I just want to add about uh, the politics here. Without being too political, I think what, what we've been doing in our scholarship itself is already a, a political thing because the Fulbright Scholarship is a, is a political act 
by 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 the, the, the U.S. government and the, the, the late Fulbright uh, Senator Fulbright as well. But I think uh, the way we do ourselves in the field is is pretty much how how skillful we are crafting our politics into this 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 uh, the Fulbright scholars kind of uh, activities in, in the more academia setting. But I agree with, with completely with Vivian here that uh, this is this is the kind of art how you put yourself and follow your consciousness. But then also uh, you know you are you are placed in a, in a, in a system of administration of scholarship that. Uh, requires you to follow certain things. I think you, you can jog between those things, you are safe, but we, we cannot detach ourselves uh, from what we, we've been involved, especially if you're personally into that particular situation that you mentioned, Kate, I think, and, and also Faye, that you, you are in that kind of situation, you cannot just detach from, uh, from, from the reality. And I think, I think the experience of yourself into that situation is, is another interesting thing to share with the developer for the audience. So the way back to my work, actually this is very much political because the restructuring of the institution in the government is a political move in terms of the, the change the organization, the structure and the people. And I'm, I'm part of the, 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 the process. That's why mm, then I, I can share the experience here. For, so this, this is back to my, my, my concern, but Again, thank you for, for, for this, uh, this, this space, uh, hosting for this one. I'm learning a lot from you and from the notes in the chat box as well. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think we could say that having a workshop, having a discussion like this is another way of sharing our research findings and opening up these topics for discussion. You know, I mean, this is exactly the kind of work that I wanna do. Like, just, it's wonderful to talk with all of you who are from all over the world and have traveled all over the world and just to hear from different disciplines. Um, it's really eye-opening for me. Um, and so I, I think this is, <laughs> this is a really valid way that we can share our findings too, besides writing it up and you know, putting it on a website or whatever, that we can just have a conversation together. So, so thank you all for coming. I appreciate all of you and, and the conversation that we've had. Um, I will be sending out a recording of, of our conversation. Um, there were a lot of people that registered that did not make it, uh, which, which is common. Um, so I, I like to send out the video. Um, and yeah, if anyone has any follow-up comments or, or suggestions for future workshops, just shoot me an email. Um, if you have an idea for another workshop that you would like to lead, um, you can email uh, contact at fullbridge.org in the chat um, and um, and you can you can suggest it to Zoe. All right, thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of your day or evening. Um, and I will hopefully see you soon. Thank you.